Tēnā koutou. Uh, welcome to the Trainee Wellbeing webinar. I'd like to start the session with a karakia. Tū tawa mai i ronga, tū tawa mai i raro, tū tawa mai i waho, tū tawa mai i roto. Kia tou, ai te mauri e tū, te mauri ora ki te katoa. Hou mi e, hui e, tai ki e. And then I'll pass you over to my co-chair, Dr. Tom Wilkinson, who will formally welcome you to this event. Kia ora, and uh, welcome to the Te Huia Ata Ata Mō Te Waiola o Ngā Tauiri Mahi, the Trainees Wellbeing Webinar. Uh, my name is Tom Wilkinson. I'm an advanced trainee in adult medicine. I'm doing general medicine in endocrinology based in Autotahu Christchurch. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Aotearoa New Zealand Trainees Committee. And my colleague, Dr. Media Warren and myself will be facilitating this webinar. Uh, so tonight's event includes an interactive presentation from our wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Susanna Ward, followed by a Q&A session with our expert panel. So just for a bit of history, this webinar originated uh, last year when our, um, the Aotearoa New Zealand Trainees Committee annual flagship event, which is our training study, was unfortunately cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But as a committee, we still wanted to provide an opportunity for trainees to connect, um, given the isolation that, we, that many were experiencing across both Aotearoa and over in Australia. Um, and it went pretty well, and our committee decided to continue this event and modify it based on your feedback. So that's why we're here. Um, so um, moving on to some whakawhanauna tōna, I'd like to invite some of our attending committee members and our panellists to introduce themselves. So just looking through what the order I've got on my screen, we can start with a brief introduction from Susanna, who we'll hear more from later. Yep, kia ora. I'm Susanna. I'm Dr. Wood. It's lovely to be here. It's a privilege to talk about something I'm really passionate about and that I think is really relevant and important to all of us, which is basically, you know, recognising our needs and um, prevent and putting in place strategies and techniques to prevent burnout. Um, I'm based in Newcastle. I'm a rehabilitation specialist, a mum and uh, self-proclaimed wellness enthusiast. I um, am pretty interested in all things human mastery just so that I can make the most of my life. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, next on my list, I've got uh, Chang Ho. Hey, yeah, so I'm Chang. I'm an advanced trainee in general medicine and uh, infectious diseases, currently a PhD student over in Oxford. Uh, and I've been part of the trainees committee uh, for a number of years now. Um, and very much looking forward to hearing all about wellness and how we can help preserve that at a time when we're all, when all of us are sort of yo-yoing back and forth between our, our homes where we're locked down, and um, at least in New Zealand, uh, and, uh, and, and, our, and sort of the frantic workplaces um, in, in this, in this post-COVID era. Thanks, Jen Ho. And now on to Erin Horsfell. Kia ora koutou. my name is Yaren, I'm one of the Māori representatives here on the Aotearoa New Zealand Trainees Committee. I'm an advanced trainee based here in Auckland, Tamaki Makoto, doing uh, general medicine and gastroenterology. I'm very excited to be here this evening, I'm looking forward to what we might learn. Uh, next we've got Dr. Fritha Henry. Hi, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Fritha Henning topo ingoa. Um, I'm a medical oncologist um, and associate director of Te Pūruri o Te Ora in Auckland, um, Cancer and Blood, and a passionate crossfitter and mother, amongst uh, other things. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, next we've got Dr. Glenn Williams. Got a koutou. Um, Paul Glenn Taka um, I work in Tamaki Makaurau, and I'm an intensive care and anaesthesia trainee. Uh, it's a privilege to... Um, be invited to uh, be involved in this webinar and speak to you all today. Thanks, Glenn. And finally, we've got Dr. Louise Webster. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, I'm a, well, originally a paediatrician and then trained as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. So I'm now the clinical director of the consult liaison team in Starship um, and, a, and of the palliative care team. And I'm kind of a fairly crazy musician. It's called Fiddling While Rome Burns in my family. I've got children and grandchildren, and I'm delighted that this webinar is happening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle. I might be the only non-doctor here, but really uh, privileged to be here. I'm a, a high school teacher. So yeah, look forward to sharing a couple of um, things that have worked really well for me around burnout. So thanks for having me. Kia ora, Michelle. Thank you. We're really pleased to have you to join us. It's always nice to have 
diversity of um, viewpoints. Thank you. So now I'd like to move on to um, introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Susanna Ward. Uh, Susanna is a physician of rehabilitation medicine, currently working in brain injury and lifestyle and wellness rehabilitation in Newcastle, New South Wales. She served as an RACP board director from 2016 to 2018 and was a member of the faculty and college trainees committees from 2014 to 2018. Susanna has always been a strong advocate for trainee health and well-being, with a special interest in wellness, mindfulness and yoga. She teaches these skills to her patients and other health professionals during intern orientations, weekly staff workshops and conferences. She's been involved in research looking into intern wellness and well-being, including a project awarded an advancement in medicine grant. Thank you for joining us today, Susanna, and I look forward to handing over to you to learn some more. Thanks. Thanks, Amelia. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about strategies to prevent burnout, um, which is a very different talk to managing burnout. So I just wanted to preface that. And before we start, I also wanted to preface the fact that the intention of this talk, um, and I think of the webinar in general, is to, to empower people and to destigmatize something that all humans are vulnerable to, and particularly high functioning people with very stressful careers like doctors and that this is not something to be ashamed of and sometimes we're in situations and environments where you can be applying all the self-care in the world and be an entirely capable resilient person and it's unfortunately inevitable that you're going to be burnt out because certain external factors or situations that you are in are just um, more than what you can modify so by no means is this my way of saying you know, the system's fine and this is an issue with resilience. Absolutely not. There are a lot of things that need to be optimised in the medical system. And that's actually why I got involved in the college and the governance, um, which I actually found surprisingly made me feel better about myself, which I thought would be draining. So the talk's going to be a little bit of theory uh, so that you can understand why I think so highly of some of these tools and a lot of practice as well, because you can know it all and understand the theories, but if you're not actually implementing and actioning the practices, then you're gonna miss out on the benefits. And although I think a lot of these things will be known to people and already a part, hopefully, of their own self-care routine, there might be something novel that you can take away and go, oh, I quite like the, the feel of that. that, that really resonated with me and Google it and practice it in your own time that maybe had we not done it together, you may not have been um, uh, exposed to. So when well, we're talking about preventing burnout, well, what is burnout? There's lots of definitions out there. But as I see it, burnout is essentially when you haven't met your needs chronically enough. I mean, we can all go through periods of time where we're not able to uh, optimally meet our needs and we can be OK. But if it's for a long enough period of time, it's just an inevitable fate, really. So why does this happen? Well, there are things that are outside of us, the external factors and stresses. Uh, maybe you're in a situation where you've got limited access to the things you need to be well. Uh, an example that springs to mind was when I was a trainee, it was often difficult to find good food at work. So I just got into the routine habit of packing a lunch. Um, and then, of course, lifestyle. If you're on shift work, night, what, night shifts and things like that, then, or you've just had a baby, then you can't always get the sleep you might need. But there's also other things um, that are within us that we can potentially modify and this might sound a little harsh but some of us are ignorant and I certainly was that way I took a long time to know what my needs were I didn't know um, what I needed but even once you work out what your needs are you might notice a little internal resistance to meeting them and again I will be the first to acknowledge that I had a bit of that. Uh, I used to think it was a waste of time. Um, some of the things I now prioritize and make time for, and I certainly dismissed a lot of these practices as woo-woo, a bit strange and awkward and weird. Um, so I just think it's useful uh, when you're looking to prevent burnout to at least know what your needs are and to see the barriers to meeting them and to have a little um, insight into those. So we're gonna dive right into what I think is the key core skill. And I spent years practicing practicing this and it actually took me years to really understand what it was and a wonderful benefit of all that years of practice is that you sort of rewire your brain to be naturally more mindful so that even when you're not intentionally practicing mindfulness your everyday experience of life is just naturally that little bit more mindful so find a comfortable position rest your hands in your lap your feet on the earth and 
relax your body so that you're less likely to be distracted by tension and discomfort. And mindfulness is practicing keeping your attention where you choose. So we're gonna use the breath. The breath is an anchor to the present moment. It's always available. You can bring your awareness to your breath on a ward round, in the middle of an exam, when you're giving a talk. So bring your awareness fully now to your breathing. Noticing how it is to breathe, feeling the breath. Resting your attention as best you can on your breathing. Not trying to change the breath, not analyzing, just noticing how it is to breathe in this moment right now, just breathing. And when you're inevitably distracted, the mindfulness practice is non-judgmentally noticing that you've been distracted and turning your attention back to your breath over and over again. Resting awareness on breath. Commonly, we get distracted by thoughts and mental distraction. It can be a sensation, an urge, a feeling, or it could be something going on outside of us. And the mindfulness is being distracted and choosing to put our attention back on our breath. Take a deep breath in and out. Okay, we'll move on. So just check in now, are you a robot, a god, or a doctor, right? So if you're a doctor, then like all doctors, I mean, sorry, if you're a human, um, like all humans, you are vulnerable to burnout when you can't meet your needs. But doctors do have a particularly stressful career. It's very time pressured, especially if you work in the public health system. Um, there's a lot of people to be working with, diverse groups of um, uh, staff, colleagues, patients. There's a lot of interpersonal relationships to manage. And, you know, you've seen the circle from the college, the physicians are expected to be all sorts of things, leaders, auditors, supervisors, um, and then throw in work politics, long day, shift work, and the never ending study and CPD requirements. It's not an easy life that we've chosen for ourselves, but it is a wonderful life and a privileged life. And as I said, we're not gods or doctors. We're just as vulnerable as all the other humans. And just like all the other humans, we have inevitable, unavoidable life-sustaining needs. So, I mean, this isn't uh, necessarily accurate, but the way that I see it is that we've got three different types of needs. Physical needs, these are the obvious ones that we all can accept and not acknowledge. I mean, it's a no-brainer. We all need warmth, uh, safety and shelter. Um, nutrition, hydration, adequate downtime and sleep. Um, but we also need other more nuanced esoteric needs that maybe in certain Western cultures, um, particularly my in, um, upbringing, we didn't talk about these so much. They were less obvious and maybe I sort of didn't think about them for a long time. And these are the emotional needs that humans need. So to be seen and heard and acknowledged, to feel loved and trusted. And that can come from other people and it can also come from yourself and to a certain extent, being able to give that to yourself. And then we have spiritual needs. And I think the Kiwis do this the best. And I think Australians have a lot to learn from the spirituality um, of New Zealand. And as far as I see it, you can have a sense of spirituality or not really. But to me, your spiritual needs are about having a sense of connection to others or to something beyond yourself. So that can be a religion. It can be nature. Um, it can be your colleagues your family or just your partner. Um, and also I think um, that if you live a life aligned with your values and priorities, which we'll talk about later, then you will be meeting your spiritual needs. And this is all about being who you want to be despite the stress and adversity that you may go through at times. And then as individuals, we all have um, personality traits and conditioning that we acquire over the years that may bring um, particular needs to you. Um, so the next technique we're going to practice, so as you see, there's a bit of theory, a bit of practice, is the STOP technique. It's an acronym for stop what you're doing, take a deep breath in, observe all that's going on inside of you. So noticing thoughts, feelings, urges, emotions, noticing all going on around you, things you can see, feel, touch, going through the senses, and then proceed. So this is a really simple technique. You can um, schedule an alarm in your phone. I used to do it as an advanced trainee at John Hunter when I parked my car at lunch um, and then when I got back in my car and it's a mindfulness-based stress reduction technique which is an evidence-based therapy um, using mindfulness to 
uh, equip you with lots of stress reduction tools that you can use. And I just really love this one because it's so simple and yet actually very effective. And it helps you, just like mindfulness, get out of your head, get out of the busyness of every day and just bring a little presence into your everyday experience um, and also start to work on that connection to self, connection to your inner world, um, which maybe some doctors aren't so good at because we're so busy and very good at being in our heads and, and getting jobs done. So it just allowing you to build that connection, which is where you're going to work out what your needs are. So let's just practice that right now. Stop. Stop what you're doing, which is listening to an amazing talk. And then take a deep breath in. Observe things going on inside of you. What's your mind doing? Nature of the thoughts. Is the mind racing? Was it pretty zen? Are you feeling okay? What's the landscape within your emotional um, feelings? And then notice things going on around you. What can you smell? What are you feeling? Just noticing and then proceed, which we will do right now. So there's a lot of challenges um, unique to doctors. I mean, not, not saying that all doctors have these traits, but very commonly, um, these are some of the things that have allowed us to get into medicine, to stay in medicine, and often make us really special good doctors. But if they're not uh, acknowledged and managed, they can also be our downfall. So some of us, and um, I'm not poking fingers at anyone but myself, but type A, relentless standards, people pleasing, at times fear of speaking up and harming your reputation. There's a lot of competition, um, unfortunately, uh, comparisons, they can really undo you. And as I said earlier, we're so busy and, and good at studying and things like that, that we can be a little disconnected to our body and our emotions. And I think we've been so busy studying that um, maybe we haven't had the opportunity to practice uh, extracurricular activities or learn a little bit more about human mastery. Uh, I always thought it was really bonkers that you can learn so much about the body and all the systems, but not very much about managing humanness. It seems to be that these sorts of skills are reserved for psychologists or psychiatrists, like as if managing your mind and your body and just um, having some human mastery to nail life was something that only people with mental illness could have, but it's not the case. And I think in the future, all these things will be more discussed in primary school and high school. So what's the way forward if you've chosen this career for yourself, which I do hope you stick with, is just to know yourself, know yourself, know your needs, accept yourself, manage yourself, run your own race, do what you need and be kind to yourself. Be honest with yourself about what you need. And sometimes that's tough. And so if you can match that honesty with self-compassion, it usually works well. Know your boundaries, speak up and assert your boundaries is a huge part of preventing burnout. And just become a master of your humanness to live your best life. And these things are relevant to your whole life, not just your medicine and, and, your, and your career, but just about just being the best version of you so that you can make the most of this incredible experience. So the next skill is a body scan, and this is a really good tool to use uh, maybe after work or when you just feel like a bit of downtime to practice being in your body and less in your head. Sometimes uh, if you're overwhelmed by thoughts or worry, this is a good practice. And if you want to really treat yourself, you can add in a relaxation element to it. So every time you exhale, as you scan through parts of your body, you relax and use the exhale to release tension. That's a nice little gift. We're just going to practice it um, in one part of the body in the interest of time. So again, find a comfortable position, maybe shut down your eyes. If you feel that you're being distracted by visual stimulus, relax your body so you're not in pain. Take a deep breath in and a long breath out. And bring your awareness as best you can to your right thumb. Resting your attention on your right thumb, noticing all the sensations that you can detect over your right thumb. And noticing now, keeping your awareness as best you can over all your right fingers like a curious scientist, not judging, not changing, just noticing what you can from your right hand. Noticing the sensations of your right wrist and scanning up now to what you can feel in your right forearm, your right elbow, your right upper arm, and your right shoulder. I want you to rest your attention now 
as best you can to your whole right arm. Noticing your whole right arm, letting go of distractions as they inevitably come up into your awareness and noticing your right arm, all the sensations, resting your attention in your body, letting go of thought, letting go of your to-do list, letting go of the outside world and just keep your awareness as best you can on your right arm. And let that go now, take a deep breath on in and out and we'll move on. So that scan, you can go through your whole body. I would Google that. There's a million um, pre uh, meditations that go through the whole thing. One yoga version of it that's really nice is uh, the yoga nidra that runs through the whole body and um, brings in a few other elements to it, which is a lovely thing to do. All right, so I guess my key message is if you want to prevent burnout, have some human mastery, right? So understand yourself and understand your needs, accept yourself and accept the needs that you have, and then try and look after yourself and meet the needs as best you can. Having said that, it's really um, important to acknowledge that some of the things we need, we can do for ourselves. But if anyone's watched that TV show alone, you would understand that most humans need each other. And we've talked about physical needs of warmth and safety. Your environment's really key. And we know that as rehab physicians, we're all about the environment as well as um, optimizing a person's body and you know, using equipment and resources and supports. So think about, you know, optimizing your environment as well. But this next section is more about what you can do for yourself. So this is about the self-help, the self-care. And a lot of this self-mastery is really powerful, but I just wanted to say that also we do need each other and we do need a healthy environment. So what to me, like human mastery, real wellness, when I talk about wellness, I'm not talking about the stereotypical market of, you know, a blonde girl eating kale doing yoga, although I do like those things. I'm talking about human mastery. And this stuff actually is taught to most successful people. Uh, it was in the Australian Institute of Company Directors course. You know, they, they teach about uh, mindfulness and things like that. If you really want to be successful, you've got to understand yourself, accept yourself and know how to manage yourself. And what are we? We're humans. So to me, real wellness is three things. It's self-awareness, self-acceptance and self-care. And I think if you can do these things for yourself, if you can nail that some of the time, most of the time, then you're very likely to avoid burnout. Uh, and that's been my experience. I have had several episodes of burnout as a trainee and I don't let it happen anymore, <laughs> I can tell you now. Um, okay, so self-awareness. Uh, this is the first pillar of real wellness. So how do you build your self-awareness? And this is um, really key to meeting your needs because you've got to be able to connect with yourself to know what you need, right? So this is understanding your mind and being able to manage your mind, understanding your body, being able to read your body, understanding your emotions, being able to see and hear and feel, feel your emotions and respond to them. Um, so the tools that I swear by is the mindfulness um, and then meditations. They are two different things. Uh, ref any reflective practices, journaling is incredibly powerful, sometimes very hard to get there because it really pulls you up on your BS. So it can be quite confronting. So sometimes I only journal when I actually really need to. I just wish it was something I could do every day. But it doesn't have to be these sorts of, um, you know, I guess spiritual practices. It can be really um, problem solving. Maybe it's just taking some time once a week to sit down and plan your week, to think about things you did well, to think about what you want to work on next time, to check in with your choices and your goals and make sure they're aligning with your values and priorities. There's a lot of physical activities that you can do that build self-awareness. So things like yoga, tai chi, qigong. This is not flexibility and stretching. This is very much about union and connecting to your inner world, connecting to your breath and building that mindfulness muscle as well as the physical practice. And then, of course, you know, professional help is incredibly useful if you um, are privileged and ha have the time and energy to go to a psychologist or the money for a life coach, counsellor, or even just chats with your mates. Um, these things really help bring insights into yourself and to what you need as, as an individual. Okay, so we're gonna practice some yoga. It's just one minute chair yoga, but I just wanna give you a taster of it to make a point. All right, so find a comfortable position, maybe sit up a little bit more um, and bring your arms out to the side. We're gonna reach them up and overhead, breathing in. So the top of the inhales, the hands reach above. And as you exhale, lower your hands to your chest through a prayer position. 
and we'll do that again. So as you inhale, you're swooping your arms up overhead. And as you exhale, you're lowering your hands through your heart center. And we're gonna do that twice more, it's movement to breath. So you're bringing your attention and your awareness to the movement of the body and the breath. And you're starting to let go of thoughts, distraction, and just check in within. One last time. And exhale, beautiful. As you inhale, you're gonna shrug your shoulders backward. And as you exhale, you're gonna shrug them forward. You're gonna shut down your eyes now and you're gonna lower your right ear to your right shoulder, noticing the sensation, breathing in here. And as you exhale, you're gonna really gently lower and roll your chin to your chest, rolling your head around, bringing your left ear to your left shoulder. Breathe in, keep it there, left ear, left shoulder. And exhale, rolling it back to the other side. And breathing in to bring your right ear to the right shoulder. And exhale, lowering to the other side. And then this time, breathing in to lower the chin to the chest. And then as you exhale, bring your head back up. We're going to shake that up with a few shoulder shrugs one way on the inhale. And then the other hand. We're going to finish it off with one more inhale, arms outstretched overhead. And exhale. Beautiful. So I hope that just from doing that, you can see how yoga is more than just stretching. It's about awareness. It's about checking in. It's about mindfulness and attention to breathing. It's, it's just really great. I'm a big fan. So the second pillar of real wellness, if you want human mastery, is to build on that self-acceptance. Again, we are not gods. We are not robots. We're humans. And, and doctors, just like all other humans, need to meet their needs and know what they are. So how do you build self-acceptance or how do you accept some of the realities that we're in, some of the challenges we face? And, you know, unfortunately, some of us trainees do get exposed to really um, inappropriate circumstances that I hope we all continue to work towards eradicating. Um, certain systems are just not appropriate or okay. So how do you work through that? Well, there's a few skills you can acquire along the way. Radical acceptance is a, is a psychotherapy sort of tool of DBT, which is dialectic behavior, behavioral ter therapy, which is a really great evidence-based therapy for all sorts of health issues. Um, and radical acceptance just teaches that it's an ability to just let go of ruminating, let go of this isn't fair, let go of this is shouldn't be, and, and notice that by do, staying stuck there, you're actually causing your own suffering um, and inhibiting yourself being able to uh, address the issue head on in an efficient and effective way. And it's through this radical acceptance over and over of what is, what is, what is happening for you right now, that you can then actually address it and, and, and improve the situation. Uh, so it's just that remembering to just radically accept what is happening with you right now and then building on self-compassion and self-compassion is three things. It's mindfulness, which we've already talked about kindness. So self-kindness, that can be hard for some of us to be kind to ourselves. If you struggle with that, I like to think of like, what would I say to a friend or what would I, how would I want my friend to treat themselves in this situation? And just that connected connection to common humanity. The truth is that we all as humans um, live through pain and loss and suffering and it, it is something that binds us and connects us. So one self-compassion skill that you might want to think of in the future when um, you're faced with something that you need to let go of to prevent stress and distress and just be able to um, problem solve in a situation is you notice that the challenge you're going through. So maybe it's a pain, maybe it's um, a sadness, I don't know. You just say, gosh, I really acknowledge that this is happening to me right now. And then the next thing is you say, this is very hard for myself and I choose to be kind to myself right now. So it's a choice. So you're taking responsibility to actually meet the needs of the situation. You're, you're showing up for yourself the way you would to your child or to your friend. And then you remind yourself that you are human and that as a human, we all have this pain. So it's that three things. It's acknowledging with your mindfulness, the challenge that you're in, and then choosing that self-kindness and then connecting to your humanity. All right, so the last pillar of real wellness um, is the self-care aspect. And again, I've already said, look, some of the things that we need to have to meet our needs are beyond our control, like a safe and warm environment and a connection to others and other beings. But some of this stuff is about our relationship with ourselves and things that we can do for ourselves in our everyday life to um, optimise our self-care. So 
just about the physical needs, if, if there was one key strategy that I would suggest to prevent burnout, it would be to provide, prioritize in its sleep. I wouldn't be the first person to say sleep is not talked about enough, but if you are not meeting your sleep needs, you're really hitting yourself up like against a brick wall. You're, it's a stitch up. If you're not getting your sleep, it's making your life really, really difficult. However, getting sleep is a whole nother talk that can be, um, you know, really hard work for a lot of us, especially when you're approaching burnout or when you're in burnout. Um, what are the strategies to get your spiritual and soulful needs um, met? I've talked about your values and priorities. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, looking at ways of belonging to um, a tribe or a community, uh, connecting with um, a charity or any religion or ethnicity that you may have in your life. And, you know, sometimes when work is your life, that may mean that you're connecting to your patients or you're connecting to the colleagues that you work with and you are getting that sense of connection and belonging in that work environment. It may not be where you choose to get it, like maybe you'd prefer to be home with your family, but sometimes living a life aligned with our priorities and what we choose for ourselves is not uh, a reality. It doesn't mean you can't still be creative and get your needs met in other ways. And the emotional needs, look, again, a lot of the evidence coming out suggests that we do actually need other people to meet our emotional needs, but there is, I believe, a, to a certain extent, a relationship that must be formed between you and yourself, and you need to see and hear your emotions. You need to have regular check-ins where you acknowledge yourself so that you can actually even meet any emotional need that's coming up that otherwise you wouldn't have even known about. Um, and you also need to tr trust yourself, so be accountable. Um, look after yourself if you eat well if you sleep well if you nurture your feelings and um, do nice things for yourself you start to feel uh, safe in yourself you start to like who you are because you're treating yourself well and it creates this entire relationship with yourself where you feel safe um, and proud of who you are so look the truth is we all develop maladaptive habits um, at some point in our lives whether it be turning to food, cigarettes, drugs, I don't know, you name it, all sorts of things. This would be human. There's no shame in that. Um, and it's a whole nother talk again, but having some strategies around your behaviours, and this is something that I'm really interested in with my clinical work, like lifestyle and behavioural rehabilitation, but there's a whole science out there around habit change. Um, and there's a lot of skills that you can use to help that. So, you know, in rehab, we talk about smart goals. If you want to change habits, Sure, go smart goals, but small, tiny, tiny, small, 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 smart goals. And just every day, tiny, tiny build, tiny, tiny build. And before you know it, you've made big gains, but it's got to be small. And there's a lot of things that um, you can also do in your environment to change your habits. So if there's, say, for example, something you want to do less of, put it away, out of sight, out of mind, and put the alternative really visible. So often when we don't want something, we can focus on it too much. If you don't want something, Focus on what you do want. Um, anyway, that's another talk. So mantra. Now, this is one of the skills that I used to think was weird and dismissed and was not receptive to. And now I'm like a mantra junkie. So I have built into my everyday a little morning routine and mantras are non-negotiable because it's something I do first thing I wake up in the morning. I actually have turned into that nut bag that goes, today's going to be a good day. You know why? Because it works. And I'm sick of being negative. I'm sick of being anxious. And I just want to enjoy my days. And I don't need to see the Cochrane review on this anymore because the best evidence is my lived experience. And I can tell you now that this works. Do it, you know, start your mantras, send me an email, and tell me, you know, that it hasn't worked. So right now, just imagine something that you want more of in your life. So think about maybe a trait that you wish to embody. So these are the things, the ways you wish to come across, the ways you wish to act. Um, and just say to yourself, I am whatever it is. So, for example, I have been a very anxious person for many years of my life. And that's not my true nature. I didn't, I wasn't born anxious. It was sort of conditioned into me, unfortunately. And so a big mantra that I rarely have a day without repeating is I'm calm. So, and so mantra is something that you might just do first thing in bed. It might be something that you journal. It might be something that you're repeating yourself in the heat of the moment. Uh, but it is very, very powerful. Okay, so what are the giants of self-care? Um, 
these things are, you know, historically known. They are repeated through many religions, through many ethnicities, cultures. Why? Because they just seem to work. Um, so we've talked about mindfulness meditation, journaling, so powerful, breath work. That's a big field. We haven't really done very much of that. We did a bit of mindfulness of breathing, but there's a lot of pranayama. There's a lot of vagal toning and breathing work you can do. Um, if you're interested in that, just Google it. There's all sorts of free resources that can come up, but developing your relationship with your breath and manipulating your breath, um, which is very different to the mindfulness of breath where you're not actually changing it, you're just practicing noticing on it, noticing it, but changing your breath. So you're extending the exhale, you're breathing deeper and some breath holds, they can be really, really effective to relax. Um, mantra affirmations, uh, movement. I'm a big fan of exercise. I think everyone should exercise every day, even if it's just 10 minutes of stretching. Um, visualization, that's super powerful. We use that in medicine. I use that in my everyday life. So if I have something big coming up, a new opportunity, and I notice I'm nervous, I will often use um, visualization as a strategy to prepare myself. If I can see it, I can do it. Um, Relaxation, that's different for everyone. I mean, I know people that relax in the garden. Some people bake. My husband goes for epic bike rides. Optimize your environment. I'm a big fan of decluttering, removing things that don't work for you, filling, you know, into your everyday life, all the things you want for yourself, good food, um, a beautiful, clean environment. Um, you know, put your surfboard out in so it's really obvious, um, things like that. And incorporating rituals and routines and structure into your everyday, most successful people do this because it just, um, it's a really efficient way of meeting a whole bunch of needs at once. So my morning ritual, it ticks all the boxes. And then after, you know, 10 minutes, I've met my needs and I've started my day well. Um, connection to nature, who doesn't feel soothed and um, nurtured in nature? And to be of service, that is such a biggie. I forget how good I feel when I help people. And we're really lucky in medicine as doctors, we get paid to be of service. Um, so if you can stick in there, no matter how challenging it gets, it is a really worthwhile profession. Um, and hobbies, again, I said, I think one of the sadness, saddest things about being a doctor is that we spend literally decades studying and practicing um, science and medicine that there's no time to practice these other things so you know when I realized I needed these skills to cope like yoga and things like that I had to start work, working part-time to even have the time to go and do these things and that's okay I wouldn't regret it for a second um, stillness and silence do not underestimate the power of just literally doing nothing you don't have to meditate you don't have to um, you know journal you can just be still and silent However, that's easier said than done. And when you're stressed out of your brain or burnt out, it's probably impossible, but it's a really good thing to do to maintain your sense of wellness and novelty. So if you want to um, keep your brain in good nick um, and live your life to the full, you know, with self-compassion, just try and find your edge and just gently push yourself out of your comfort zone and do new things, try new things, always be willing to experiment with new things. Um, I'm not quite sure how we're going for time, but I might just miss this one. It's a wonderful tool that you could just Google. There's a million versions of this. Um, there's an app that I'll mention at the end of this talk. Um, but this is a really good uh, meditation where you can use the visualization and concept of yourself as an inner child and you check in with your inner child and um, see how they feel, see what their emotional state is, see what their uh, appearance is so that you can sort of identify their need and um, then be able to realize that that's the need you have. Because sometimes uh, I'll go to check in and I don't quite know how I feel. I don't really know what emotion it is that I feel. I've been so busy or whatever that I'm a little disconnected and not quite sure what I need. So I like to turn to this strategy in that situation um, to be guided to what it is that I need to do for myself. Uh, okay, so... If you're interested in resources, there are so many, but these are my gold. These are my favorites, right? There's Insight Timer. I wonder if anyone else uses this. It's an app on your phone. It's free. And the reason why I love this is because there is a never ending supply of meditations. It's literally uploaded every evening. It's international. So if there are certain accents that irritate you, then you can just move on. And if you like someone, you can follow them and donate to them. And yeah, it's a really good hub of resources. 
there's guided meditations, uh, 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever you can pick and choose your, what you like. You can search for themes. So you can write in there in a child meditation. Uh, there's also music and things like that. And there's live things. You can join live groups. The Waking Up, Waking Up app by Sam Harris is very good. And I think in particular doctors would resonate to that because he's secular, he's a neuroscientist and philosopher. Some of you would know Sam Harris's work. Um, and the Waking Up app is a real, um, real achievement. It's just absolutely fantastic. Podcasts, I love Ginger Campbell's Brain Sciences. My self-study in neuroscience really helped me develop um, a new perception of myself and perspective and understanding of what it is to be conscious, the mind, um, what emotions are, and just see them differently and be able to diffuse from them rather get fused to them. I really, really recommend that podcast. All in the All in the Mind by ABC. There's lots of books. Um, I mentioned MBSR, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction groups that you can join. You just Google it. I'm sure there's one local to you, and that's where I learned the STOP technique. Open Ground is a website. They have um, free meditations each week that you can join online. So this is the last slide. I've talked about values and priorities. I really think it's key. I teach this to all my patients. No matter what you're going through, no matter what diseases, disabilities, what age, I really believe we can all be well. I really think it comes down to this, that each and every day, as best you can, you behave and you treat others the way that you choose, the way that you want to show up. This is your values. So for me, a big one is just to be loving and warm and make people feel good. Um, my priority, which most people's are, which is the things that I want to be spending my time and energy and resources are on, um, are my family and my health and things like that. So the difference between the two is the values are how you wish to be and the priorities are the things you wish to spend your time and resources on. Values are a right. No matter what you're going through, you can embody your values. And if anyone's read Man's Search for Meaning, then they would understand that this is the key message of that book. Priorities are a privilege. Unfortunately, there are all, we all have times in our life where we may not be able to live um, spending all of our time on our priorities. However, the trick to being well is if even if we're not able to prioritize our lives the way that we wish, we can still show up embodying our values and we will still feel well. So if there was one skill that I would impress upon you moving forward to prevent burnout, it would just be to spend a little time once a month, even just once a year, checking in, what are your values? And you can think about them in terms of your roles. So like as a, as a friend, as a, your values, um, your relationship to yourself, how do you want to treat yourself at work as a doctor, et cetera, and then check in with your priorities. And then when you don't feel well, when you feel like you're coming up to burnout, Take some time to reflect on the decisions you're making, the ways you're showing up at work, the ways you're carrying yourself at home, um, the things you're putting your time and energy in, and just see if it's a little bit off um, your, your compass. And if you can just readjust things to, to come back to your true nature, what, you're, what you value and prioritise, then you'll get back on track to your wellness. So that's all from me. If you'd like to connect, I have an Instagram website and an email. Um, I'd love to hear now from you guys what you do to stay well because um, really it is a very unique recipe and we're all very different and this is not, by no means um, original rocket science. I'm just sharing with you my experience and my um, strategies and I'd really like to hear from others or if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Kia ora, Susan. Thank you so much for that fabulous talk. Um, it was so many insights and there was so much crammed in there that I just wanted to um, download into myself. Um, uh, there, there's a few concepts that I'm going to take away. Um, human mastery is a new term for me and I really I really like that concept that you've introduced um, and I'm going to be working on that for myself. Um, and I think the concept of radical acceptance is also new for me and I've, I see that in our Q&A, um, Sammy has um, quite helpfully um, recommended radical acceptance by Tara, is it Brack? as a starting point and so I'll be taking the nap is it something you'd recommend as well um so I would like to invite the um, attendees to fire through some questions on our Q&A um, in the meantime maybe I'll get started with um, one of mine um, with the concept of radical acceptance um I don't know whether uh, would you mind commenting on how that um, you might manage the tension between kind of um 
developing radical acceptance for yourself while working in a profession where I feel like um, suffering is not accepted and we're always kind of being put in the position to um, alleviate that or treat or fix. Sorry, say that again. Oh, I just, um, ha, uh, can you comment on the tension between trying to develop radical self-acceptance as a clinician, where perhaps um, in the field that we work in um, for our patients and our colleagues, that maybe that's not something that will, uh, radical acceptance might not be something uh, innate to the work that we do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I guess, yeah, you're right. I think I think what you're saying that as doctors, we we tend to aim to fix things and some we're not maybe so good at just accepting good enough or, hey, I can't fix this right now. I'm just going to have to accept it. Um, I think, unfortunately, the truth is that a lot of people end up like, you know, in medicine, we have chronic diseases, we have chronic pain, we have lots of things we can't take away. If you sort of get stuck in that, ah, oh, you know, but this, I can't accept it. Like I've got to fix it. I'll fix it, fix it. It's not that that's wrong. I mean, you can live your life that way, but you're missing out on a whole lot of other things that you do have because you're focusing on something that can't be changed, which is just causing you suffering. So I think just spending a little time about thinking when you notice, when you detect in yourself that you're suffering, ask yourself, what is it that I'm not accepting? And then remind yourself that it's okay to have things that you can't change. It's just an inevitable part of life and that we are not um, able sometimes to modify all the things that we wish for ourselves. There's a lot of injustice in the world, isn't there? There's a lot of things that shouldn't happen, that are just atrocities and incredibly heartbreaking. And you just refocus your resources and attention on the things that you can modify. I mean, it's just that wisdom, isn't it? The, the um, you know, accept what you can't change and change what you can and have the wisdom to know the difference. Um, so, you know, whether or not you're looking at a patient and going, oh my gosh, I just find it really hard to accept that I can't help this person versus you're in a situation where you're facing a truth that you can't change. It's the same thing. At the end of the day, there's a lot we can't change and we're better off uh, targeting our resources and energy and time on the things we can and then limiting the pain that that thing we can't change can cause us by accepting it because by not accepting it we're just suffering does that make sense so the other day I'll share with you something I'm embarrassed to say I was speeding and I got caught however can I just say that it used to be a 90k zone and something has changed and all of a sudden it's an 80k zone. I hadn't driven there for a really long time. So I didn't know that. And so I was only actually two k's over. Anyway, so I got a speeding ticket and I was so annoyed because I really didn't mean to speed. In fact, I really tried not to speed and I was tired. And anyway, so it was like eight o'clock at night and I was still ruminating over this speeding ticket. And I was like, practice your radical acceptance, Susanna. There's nothing I can do. Like I'm literally just causing myself a whole lot of pain by ruminating over this. And I just radically accepted it over and over and over, knowing that, you know, all I can do is learn from this and move on. So that's just a really simple example of um, being aware of that strategy and going, hey, this is the time to use it. Cool. Thank you. That that does clarify things. And um, <laughs> you brought to mind something that actually my husband says to me all the time. He's not medical, um, which is control the controllables. Um, but I now that I've come from someone that's not my husband, I think I'll I'll might internalize that now. <laughs> yeah. Um so I don't know if anyone's got any extra questions there. Aha, great. Um an anonymous TD has said, thanks for a great presentation. Um I used to misunderstand the concept of acceptance as giving up, but actually it's much more than that, isn't it? Could you talk to the way in which acceptance can actually light a fire under us to fix things? Wow, this is really interesting that you guys have both sort of picked up on that. Um, can I talk? Yeah, so it isn't giving up, giving up, isn't it? It's, it's quite empowering, really. Um, I've seen a lot of people waste a long time, of, a lot of their life um, suffering things that need to be accepted. I'm sure that you guys have met those patients as well or people in your life that just get stuck and it tortures them. Um, and it becomes their focus. So 
it, to be able to radically accept something that cannot be changed is incredibly empowering and liberating and it frees up all of your attention to do, to, to be looking at other things. Um, so you've asked, could, could you talk to the way in which acceptance can really actually light a fire under us to fix things? Yeah, okay, well, sometimes when we have to accept something that can be changed, then it's only by acknowledging it and accepting its reality that we can see it, right? So a lot of truths are very painful to acknowledge and that's why a lot of people don't go there. <laughs> and in yoga, we talk about satya, which is the ultimate truth, and ahimsa, which is loving kindness. And in yoga, they teach that they come together. So this is a yogic philosophy of um, sort of the morals and ethics that you live by. So you live with satya and ahimsa so that you can really see life as truly as it can. Because a lot of truth out there is very painful, right? So when you lovingly accept reality, it means you can then actually see your reality and be able to engage with the truth. And, and if there's something to be fixed, fix it efficiently and effectively because you're really seeing it for what it is. So, for example, I think there's a lot of shame in getting burnt out. And if you find yourself that you are burnt out or that you end up being burnt out, or maybe you reflect on the time when you have been, you might remember or you might be able to imagine that it's actually quite hard to acknowledge. Um, it's certainly really, really challenging to tell other people. Um, and you might end up needing time off. Okay, so sometimes when you're in that situation, actually the environment's got to change, which is where we're talking about the systems need to be optimized, not just people building on their res resilience, that's offensive and inappropriate. But, you know, sometimes we just need time off and that's really tough. So being able to compassionately address the truth there, like actually, you know what, I'm burnt out, I'm a human, I need time off work and really accept that truth means you can then go and deal with it because otherwise you just keep going and who knows what trouble you'd fall into. So sometimes it is very hard to accept and see the truth. And so you've got to um, have a bit of practice and a strategy around doing that. So the idea of acceptance and self-compassion, it sounds woo-woo and strange, but they're actually really, really hard um, and tough when you're conditioned not to be that way. And I think a lot of doctors may be that way. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of reading, you can get books on these things, or even seeing a psychologist can help. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for that, Susanna. Um, I think in the interest of time, we've actually over overstepped, um, but thank you, um, clearly a very um, engaging topic. Um, so I might hand over to Tom to take us to our next part of this webinar. Thanks, Amelia. And um, thank you again, Susanna, for an excellent talk. I, um, I, did, I found it very um, informative and, um, yeah, a good reminder. I suppose some techniques I've heard before, but um, probably could use more. And, um, yeah, and just a reminder about, you know, that, that stuff about controlling what you can control. And, yeah, it was a good talk. Um, so thank you again. Now, we're now going to have a five-minute break for everyone just to stretch your legs or grab a drink. Um, so during this time, we're going to show a brief video uh, giving an overview of our, um, the RACP Employee Assistance Program and how to use it. So take five minutes, people, and we'll be back um, shortly. Thank you. The RACP Support Program is a fully confidential and independent helpline available 24 hours, seven days a week for all fellows and trainees across Australia and New Zealand. It is a complimentary service as a benefit for all RACP members. Members are entitled to four sessions per stream per person every 12 months. RACP members can access six different streams of people with EAP services. Those are employee, manager, career, conflict, money, and nutrition and lifestyle assist. The RACP places the utmost importance on the well-being of its members. It can be difficult to balance the pressures of the workplace, interactions with colleagues, and personal relationships. The RACP support program is provided by Convich International, who oversees local services in New Zealand, provided by VT. All Convich International consultants are qualified professionals with extensive experience in their specialty areas, with knowledge of the health industry, including registered psychologists and experienced social workers. Any information you supply to the Employee Assistance Program 
is completely confidential between you and your consultant. The program provides members with access to confidential counselling, coaching and support for workplace and personal issues. You can arrange to speak directly with a consultant face-to-face, -face, over the phone or via the internet. Details of your participation, issues or attendance will not be passed on to the RACP or your employer. You can confidentially discuss issues including nutrition and lifestyle advice, budgeting advice, interpersonal conflict and tension, work-related stress and overload, changes in your work environment, bullying, harassment and grievances, discrimination and sexual harassment, relationship or family matters, personal and emotional stress, grief and bereavement, alcohol and drug related problems, mental health, including depression and anxiety, anger and violence, crisis intervention and trauma counseling, vicarious trauma, self-harm and suicide. Converge International will periodically provide RECP with the identified statistical data that does not identify any individual information. So do you feel like you need to talk? Reach out to the RECP support program by making an appointment today or speaking directly with a consultant by calling 1300 687 327 in Australia or 0800367 in New Zealand. Thank you. Welcome back everyone after that um, quick break. Um, hope you're all well rested. So we're now going to move on to the second part of this uh, webinar, which is our, we've got a, we've got a whole panel here. Yeah, and um, we're going to do a QA and a session um, with our discussion panel. So um, we've received a few um, questions already submitted at registration. Um, and also anyone here, I'd really, um, like to remind you just to submit any questions you may have um, via the Q&A tab just at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and we'll work through all those. Um, we've got a number of panelists here who we, um, who briefly introduced themselves at the start. Um, and we'd be lucky to have them all here. So, but I thought just to start the ball rolling, just to help everyone get to know a bit more about the panelists we've got, um, we'd like to just ask each panelist for either their top tip for the wellbeing or the worst advice they ever received for preventing burnout, just making it clear what, what, which one it is. Um, so, um, just working through our panel, um, we can start off with, how about Dr. Louise Webster? Hi, um, I can actually give both. I think the worst tip I ever got was not to take some time off to travel overseas. <clears throat> and fortunately I ignored it. Um, so, so that was, um, you know, you'll irreparably damage your career and you'll never catch up. And, you know, that sort of advice about doing things that you're really keen to do is never good. I think my top tip would be, um, to have something that you're really passionate about outside of medicine. And I'm lucky for me, that's music. It kind of wasn't, in a sense, really a choice. But I think it's really important to not have all of our um, emotional life eggs in one basket. And obviously our families are going to be important and our close friends, but having something else that really matters to us besides medicine um, is probably my top tip. Mm. Uh, thanks for that, Louise. And uh, having played music with Louise myself, I can completely affirm that it's 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 a uh, it's a fantastic way to to find something else, and I find it really beneficial for for my well being as well. Um, same question. Moving on. Next, we've got uh, does would Dr. Swifter Henning like to have anything to say on this topic? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give uh, both answers as well. So um, the worst advice I ever got was when I was a house officer and um, the role of the house officer was to hold the retractor in the AAA operation uh, every week. And I could stand for about 40 minutes and then I would fall over. And so after four weeks of falling over, um, and this was stringing me out quite a bit, the anaesthetist pulled me aside and said, you know, if you cut your hand or get it scraped by roses or something like that, the charge nurse won't let you scrub in. So it effectively suggested that I self-harm in order to avoid this. So I, I would just say to you that there is never any need to take that kind of step. There's always another way. Um, 
And the best advice I've ever had um, was um, to continuously ask myself the question whenever I got stuck with something, so something's really stressing me out or there's a real problem, is to ask the question to myself, where is the team? Because you never have to do these things on your own. There's always a team to be had. It's just a matter of thinking about where it is. Mm. Michelle, do you have anything to me thoughts on the topic? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've just got, I guess, my top tip trying to sum up all the different things that work for me. It's really about finding balance, which is a lot of like what Dr. Ward said as well, just recognising, okay, I've had a really crazy day today, what can I do to help bring balance to that? Or, you know, in, in different circumstances. So yeah, so like, for example, had a busy day, I need to go and sit in a park for 10 minutes, just put my feet on the earth, just breathe slowly, do some of that nice abdominal breath, just to shift the mood into a, a nice peaceful state so yeah I think for me top tip would be definitely finding the balance yeah for myself mm. thanks great thanks Michelle and uh, Dr Glenn Williams uh, yeah so I think um, my top tip um, probably comes in a little bit in terms of how our career paths work and that the advice I got once was uh, from a specialist colleague of mine was that you know there's no rush to become a specialist um, the medicine inherently is full of a lot of competition between ourselves, um, whether it's enforced by the system or, you know, by us, our own self in terms of all oh, my colleague has achieved X many things relative to me. Um, you know, we're all out on our own journey um, to become the end goal, which for a lot of us trainees is obviously a specialist. Um, and just because that pathway is relatively well defined by, you know, a college training pathway and um, going through the pipeline, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't step off that path um, to fulfill some own things in your life, be that uh, some leave, some additional training, something that isn't part of medicine, because all those things in the end will make you a better specialist and a better doctor overall. Yeah. And I think that, that's, that's also affecting the exact same thing that Louise was talking about as well. And I suppose it's about reflecting it. It's very easy to feel pressure that you're on the treadmill and that you're going to be penalised for stepping off the treadmill. But um, it's the kind of thing you can look back on and regret not making the most of the opportunities available as well. Um, and certainly I know a lot of my colleagues do struggle with that exact issue. So it's a really good thing to be reflecting on. Um, now, I know we've heard a lot from Susanna at the wedding, but do you have any um, reflections to add to, to that on this topic, Susanna? Yeah, I think um, it's I think you're on mute, Susanna. <laughs> Gonna, saying I can't think of the worst advice, but I can. I remember the worst comment that I heard at, in my training. My supervisor said to me, because I was saying, "Oh, people aren't nurturing and supportive of us trainees," and he said, "There is no place for nurturing or support in the medical curriculum." <laughs> and I was like, wow, that is exactly what is wrong with this whole situation. But um, the best advice I got was from my favorite supervisor, who sadly has passed, and he was the most beautiful man and he said to me um I don't know what I'm doing I just fumble my way through and it was so humble and I mean this guy set up a rock he was the president of the faculty he was on the board of the club like he was a big guy but he was just human and he didn't he had no interest in wearing a mask and pretending he was something amazing. And he just made it me feel like less of an imposter and that it was okay that I felt I didn't know what I was doing and that wasn't wrong. Um, and that that was kind of normal. So I love that. And my top tip would be to try and be yourself. It's really hard. I don't know if anyone relates to this, but I feel a lot of pressure to wear a mask as a doctor. Um, you know, when you're telling your patients how to look after themselves and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you're like, oh God, I struggle to do this myself. And, you know, it's like when you do cognitive assessments, you're like, what's the date and time? And you're like, oh, is that what day it is? Okay. And you're checking your phone. But I think just try and bring a bit of yourself to, to your everyday medical practice, you know, and if that means wearing crazy socks, I don't know, but just something that brings your character so that you feel that you're able to express yourself whilst being that professional and being of service and things like that because otherwise it can be I think it's a bit stifling at times to feel that you need to be someone else I don't know does anyone relate to that absolutely yeah it's, it's you, you get those sort of those more difficult consultations don't you where it kind of feels like all right I've rehearsed this I'm putting on an act now I'm putting on a show and if, it's, and if, if a patient's happy I'll put on a good show but it's it's kind of about reconciling that with being yourself as well and and being genuine Hand over to Amelia for the next questions. 
So we've had a few questions um, submitted a, um, ahead of this um, webinar, with which people um, submitted with the registration. Um, so the first question submitted is, um, this might be something to think about. Um, why is the focus of well-being, I think they're meaning on us, rather than creating safe and productive environments? For example, uh, better working conditions, beds to sleep on and overnight shift breaks, etc. Surely we can consider basic human needs at work prior to the notion of well-being. I appreciate this is a curly question, but do we have any uh, takers for offering their uh, viewpoint on this? Um, I can answer that. Thanks, Brother. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think it's it's actually both. So, um, and I've seen a massive shift, you'd be pleased to know, over the course of the time, you know, now that there's no hairdressers, you can see the hair, the grey hair now, and... Um, I've seen a, a massive shift. I mean, this was really never considered, you know, the, the, the kind of the conditions at work were really pretty shocking when I went through my training. And um, I think actually there is a lot of thought and effort put into that now, but we've still got a long way to go. So it's just like on a pathway. And you guys will be, because you are the future, part of making that change as well. So it is about advocating for that change and, and us who've been through it going actually instead of what used to be the mantra, which is, um, well, we lived through it, so therefore you have to, we, we have an obligation to go, well, actually, it wasn't okay what we went through, and so therefore we need to be an agent of change. So that's part of it. But I also think there is this other part, which is about how do we if, we, if we have to accept that there is an imperfect system and it might take more time to change than we want it to, how do we protect ourselves and do the best that we can to, to, to look after our own selves? That's, that's what I think is um, the, the message, really. Thank you, brother. I think it's not a binary thing. So, you know, it's, it's not just, well, the system needs to be fixed and we or we need to work on ourselves solely. You know, as you say, both both things need to be addressed. But of course, you know, systemic change is hard for, for people like resident medical officers you know, to institute. But there are some things you can do if you if you want to be involved and you want to be a voice um, for those things like um, you know having better conditions in your workplace. And there are some things you can do as an RMO, but and now it'll sort of also help you in your transition to being a specialist and being more of an advocate for your colleagues. Um, so that can be getting involved in your local DHB engagement boards or working through your unions. Um, and you can allow your voice to be heard. Of course, yes, it's going to take a while to change those things. And yes, getting better sleeping conditions and things, that, they don't happen overnight. Um, but you can definitely add your voice to that. And while you're doing that, and you can also focus on yourself and try and build those resilience layers that we've been talking about today. I'd also say that I think... Um, with every generation, you get sort of generational effects. And it's a bit like parenting, that if you're a parent who was abused, then it's very easy to, to not have any other models about how you're going to raise your own children. And it takes enormous courage to, to change that. Um, and that's what medicine's like. You know, everyone's really well-intentioned. So I think it doesn't matter where we are in the... Um, in the age progression, whether you're someone near the end of their career like me or someone who's starting out like my daughter, who's, who's a trainee as well, um, that, that there are going to be questions you have to ask yourself about whether you hand on um, to the people who are junior to you what was handed on to you. And so at every point we're having to go, gosh, you know, I've been treated this way by my seniors, how am I going to treat the house surgeons or the students who are working underneath me? And what are the things that, that I see happening that I don't want to perpetrate on others? So, so I think it does require um, both advocacy and, and using the, the, the power of, of how we work together with colleagues, because there's no doubt that, that um, we're more likely to be able to change things if we if we stand together as a group, but also just reflecting at every point about this has been really awful for me. What am I doing with with people beneath, you know who are more junior to me? Um, it's an ongoing and active process. So I'm hearing that um, 
well, we've inherited this culture. We are now part of it. And so um, we, we have the ability to influence on what that culture looks like going forward, um, but also whilst taking care of ourselves. Just wondering, Michelle, did you have any thoughts um, on what you've observed um, of the medical um, field and any suggestions you might have um, from your different perspective? <laughs> okay. Um, firstly, just thank you all so much for what you do for the world and, you know, um, choosing to become doctors is, is amazing. I, I'm really... Um, yeah, honour honor you all for what you do. So thank you. And I know it's jolly hard work and you're on your feet a lot and, you know, it's very stressful. So, yeah, thank you. So um, I think oh, well, I was listening to Dr. Susanna Ward speak and I was just smiling the whole time. I was like, oh, that just a lot of what she says resonates with what has helped me. So that's that's really fabulous. So I'll just um, I'll try and sum up a few things that's helped few things that have helped me along the way I've had a few burnouts as a high school teacher and um, I've had to put some things in place to help me along the way um, so I think one of the big things for me has been <clears throat> to allow myself to not always go along with the crowd so just for example if I know like um, um, Dr Wood was talking about knowing your own needs so if I know that I'm very stressed and I need to have lunch perhaps in the park by myself is giving myself that ability to go okay I don't need to go to that busy place today if I have you know 10 minutes 15 minutes to sit under that tree maybe kick off my shoes and just let my whole nervous system calm down and then I can go back to work and I feel like a completely different person so that that's really helped me just being a little bit individual about that and other ways that I might have done that as well it's like take a yoga mat into a space where I can maybe lock a door for a few minutes, do a few stretches, do a little meditate. And um, also Dr. Wood was talking about breathing, which has been a really big one for me as well with uh, like teaching crazy teenagers. Often I just put my hand on my belly, slow breaths, um, very slow exhales really help me a lot, especially when you're trying to get a classroom of teenagers to be quiet. That can be very stressful. So just taking those really slow belly breaths and, and long exhales has helped. Um, and I think um, you might see in my, my room here is filled with plants. I've really discovered <laughs> nature and I think we are as a world discovering how much nature can help us bring us back into the you know, calm states. Um, there's some uh, beautiful books and studies being done in Japan. Uh, Shrinren Yoku, a great book of forest bathing. Uh, the Japanese government studied how just being in nature and walking through a forest for a few hours can reduce our stress levels and even for up to five days. So if we're in, in nature in the weekend, we can make ourselves, bring ourselves into a state of calm for the whole week. Um, and I think for, for myself, what I've done for the last 20 years, I've been meditating and doing yoga for the last 20 years to just help that balance. Um, this is my yoga room actually here behind you behind me here and I think for myself if I can create a space in my house I'm lucky I've got a room this time but if I if I haven't had a room it's just an area of the house which is very peaceful with a like a yoga mat a cushion maybe a candle some plants and then no technology there but I know that if I need to just calm down I can just go lie down there put my legs up the wall um, you know you guys are on your feet all the time maybe a nice space to do that you know put your legs up the wall um yeah just to, to bring some balance to that i'll just have a quick look and see oh and also um what dr ward was saying about the book man's search for meaning that's fabulous if anyone hasn't read it out there i really i was quoting that to a friend today actually so i was like oh very excited when dr <laughs> ward was talking about that um let me just see if there's anything else so i think yeah that's the main thing for me over the years because i have i actually got the shingles when i was in my early 20s because i was just going crazy crazy and um needed to just find ways to to chill out so definitely nature breath work you know get, and i think also um giving yourself like you know how sometimes you're so busy and you're like I don't have 10 minutes to slow down I don't have to you just have to go well actually that's when I really need to just go I need that you seven minutes set an alarm slow down and breathe and, and change your whole you know flip from that sympathetic nervous system into the parasympathetic so you can breathe you can digest and and some great talks people talking about nutrition and exercise as well on here so yeah, all of that. I think I've probably talked enough now, but thank you all so much for having me here and thank you for all that you're doing, you guys out there.
Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I have been admiring your, your greenery in the background and very envious, actually. I'm not totally <laughs> green-fingered. I could um, give you some plants. <laughs> but I think um, that what you brought up about nature is a really good reminder, particularly um, while we're all in our little bubbles. And um, I know for me, I go from my bubble at home to my bubble in hospital and sometimes emerge from hospital not knowing what the weather was like outside. So mm. it's a really good reminder to just at least stick my head out the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To, yeah. to find some calm yeah yeah it makes a big difference and yeah yeah definitely at the end of the day just if you can sneak in a, a little bit of nature helps a lot yeah thank you very much i hand over to tom for the next question sure yeah um thanks Amelia. look so i'm one, just as a reminder, once again, anyone in the um, in the webinar, just if you want to submit anything by the Q&A at the bottom right, we're happy to take any questions you've got. The questions can, of course, be submitted anonymously if you would prefer, um, and that's available for you there at the bottom right. But we have received a couple more questions in advance of this webinar, um, and I'm actually just going to skip ahead to one question, which is very similar to what we talked about before, but just, to, I suppose, to emphasize one of these more tricky points. So someone's asked the question, um, there are many resources about self-care, et cetera, but how can we better advocate for systemic changes that adversely affect our work, life balance and well-being? So I think this is very similar to, to the question we were talking about before. Um, I know we've got a number of trainees in attendance um, at this webinar, and something that um, I've heard often, I think we hear a bit in the committee, is some people feel that, you know, as trainees, we have all these stressors thrust upon us, all these adverse things thrust upon us, things like the work environment, uh, exhaustion losses, things like the, the exams that we have to pass, which are immensely stressful. And I think there are a number of trainees who feel that this is sort of, these are stressors that have been created by the profession, put onto us by the profession. And in many senses, it feels a little, can feel a little bit um, missing the point to say, okay, you've got to put up with these, but we'll teach you a bit about resilience on the side, which I know is a very superficial way of looking at it, but that's certainly the, the impression that can come across. And I suspect that's where a lot of these, these questions are coming from. Um, I mean, I suppose part of it is, is the fact that there are always things that you, you can't control. Um, and there are things in our profession that are inherently stressful that we can't control and, it's way, and that's why it's so important to, to think about these ways of maintaining well-being regardless. But it is this interesting issue that there's this perception that there are things that the profession have put on us that are creating that, that's creating adverse well-being. Um, so I know we've talked a bit about it already, but that's the sort of question that's come through. And I wonder if anyone else had any more specific comment to make on, on that point. Complete yeah, silence. Part of, comes, I think part of that comes there's a bit of inherited, like we talked about inherited generational trauma in the way that training works. Um, so there's a little bit of that. I think it's very true that trainees, at least you know, the ones that I work with and people that I see at, like, at hospital can sometimes get very frustrated by, oh, it's Mental Health Awareness Week, so the DHB will put a bunch of posters up, but not really put much else out there or not really do any more commitment day to day or week to week to improve employees' mental health or, or helping with, um, you know, changes in the system. And it's, it is, it's hard. It's a slow, uh, clunky system that takes a long time to affect change. Um, and I just think to add to the point I said before, it can be disempowering as a trainee to feel like there's all these requirements um, and stressors placed on you um, and to feel like you're told, oh, well, you just have to work on yourself it can be immensely frustrating. Um, but there are, there, are, there are things that you can do in terms of that systemic stuff. Like I said before about getting involved in your department, there are people who do welfare and there's always someone in the department will be interested. You can build networks with them. You can build networks and resilient networks amongst your colleagues. Um, and you can get involved with discussion groups and give your cohort a voice. And some, for some people, that's hard to do, sticking your head above the parapet, so to speak, is a hard thing for trainees to do. But if you're interested, you can get involved. Uh, but certainly, we've got to acknowledge that this is a clunky, hard thing to change, and it isn't an easy, there's no, there is no easy answer, I think. I think, too, um, Glenn, you would sort of said, look, it's not a binary matter. And I, I I think it's really important that, um, that that we don't end up thinking, well, it's either or, <laughs> you know, it's either the system will change and then everything will be fine, or um, this is totally for us to, you know, physician heal thyself, um, fix yourself if you burn out, it's, it's your fault. It's, it's absolutely neither of those, and there are also elements of both of them. So... I suppose what I'd encourage all of us to do is not 
not let the system faults and there are many and I would also say don't imagine that that's going to stop when you finish your training you know for me in my 60s I'm having a big battle to say actually I'm working full-time I actually enjoy doing core but I can no longer stay up for 36 hours which is what my core roster requires and I'm trying to campaign to say can we go to a shift system? And everyone's going, no, 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 you can't possibly go to a shift system. So so I, I hate to say this, but there are aspects of it that are always going to need to be battled for. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, if we look at long distance truck drivers or airline pilots, the things that change it are external agencies that say it is not safe for our patients for us to be working in these systems. So, so sometimes it requires a, a bigger than our system um, process to be able to say that. But I also think it's really important, with, whether we practice medicine or not, that we do what we can to maximize our pleasure and enjoyment. Um, and that does involve sorting out what sorts of things work for me. Um, I could work in the most wonderful system. And actually, I think we're going to a really fabulous team um, under resourced, but it's a lovely team to work in. But I still find I have to actively work to manage my well-being and to make sure that I don't get overwhelmed with distress from the patients that I see, the some of the really sad and awful outcomes that that I get exposed to, the times when I feel incompetent and overwhelmed by my failure to be able to change things for a child or my failure to be able to um, bring about change within a family. So I think all of us face that, I certainly do. Um, and then the times when I just actually make a mistake, I stuff up, I, I do something and I think, oh my God, you know, what was I thinking? I should have seen that coming. Um, we are all going to face all of that. And so I, I know that there are terrible things about our system, and I also know that um, I would face all of that even if I was in the most wonderful system in the world. So I want both. <laughs> I want both my personal strategies and encouraging my colleagues and my juniors and my seniors to, to find the things that work for them and also systemic change. I think it's important to remember as well, like the, the techniques that you pick up today from Susanna's wonderful talk you know those aren't just skills in your you know in a perceived battle of you versus the system or you and just your job those are skills for life yeah you know they'll help you day to day with the other things that happen you know we're we're just people at the end of the day as well yes the doctor is our job um and it has its own unique sets of skills and challenges um but all these things that you know you can pick up from this webinar these little tools to put in your toolbox and um, uh, are going to help you get through all the other little challenges you're going to face in adult life. Um, and yeah, they, don't, they won't stop when you get your consultant ticket. Um, so, you know, don't, I, th I was the guy who was, oh, this is all woo-woo -wo -wo and rubbish. You know, I was, I was that person some years ago um, and my own um, personal traumas and, and mental health issues led me to be the guy that picked up all of this and started to incorporate it into my life. And it didn't, it's not only just helped me in my work, but also in my relationships in my life outside of medicine. Um, so yeah, as I say, don't don't think of it as just, this is just tools to work at work. Uh, that you know, that can help you make a much, make you a much better person and help you improve your relationship with yourself, which at the end of the day is probably the most important thing. Thanks. For the, no, thanks for those comments, Lynn and Louise. Um, you yeah, know, it, it's it's. I think it's it's all very important stuff, and um, it is it is frustrating, but um, obviously there, there's stuff that um, it, stuff we can control, stuff we can't control. We're always advocating to try to improve what we can, but at the end of the day, wellbeing is about more than just yeah, trying to um, completely overhaul this overhaul a clunky system. Um, I think I'll pass on to Amelia now for the next question. Okay, uh, yes, someone else submitted this question, but it's quite um, <laughs> relevant to me. Um, the question is about time man management strategies. Um, uh, does the panel have any tips on how to manage task overload? Um, 
for me, I guess that relentless onslaught of unapproved clinic letters that are, I know are waiting for me all the time, no matter how hard I work on them. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess I've been listening um, and reflecting that um, some of the challenges that Susanna mentioned about being type A and kind of, um, you know, relentless and people pleasing and all those things that were challenges we can maybe harness, um, you know, for good as well. And um, so I'm not so good on um, some of the, like I need to really lean into the meditation and stillness and things like that. That's a real challenge for me. And so I kind of would take a very type A approach to it. Um, and so, for example, um, in terms of um, daily habits and also crisis situations, um, I've got an action plan <laughs> that um, I've written ahead of time so that if I am in a crisis, I can go to my action plan. I don't have to think about it, which is a very medical way um, to, to think about it, but it actually does work because then you go and it's written down and it is all your self-care, for example. So with time management, I think it's the same thing. So it is about looking at your week really honestly and going, what are the self-care things that I need to fit in? And what are the tasks that I have of which there are going to be too many? And how can I aggressively schedule that so that and outsource what I don't have to do? So there will be some things that, that you um, have to do because you can't not do them, like sign your clinic letters. But maybe you can make it easier for yourself to do that so that it's not stressful by having scheduled a particular time and maybe you're going to play yourself some music and you're going to have your coffee when you do that and it's always going to be the same time of the week if you know what I mean so that and nothing else gets in the way but you're not going to do something else that doesn't fit and what you'll find is if you actually look honestly at your week it's not going to fit because you are trying to do too much and you'll have to really pair it back and, and what comes into that too is it's got to be good enough so you've got to then you're forced to say, well, if this is the only time I have available for it, then I'm not maybe going to do it quite as perfectly as I thought I was going to do. And that's okay. So yeah, that would be my tips for that. Thanks, Rafa. I'm, I, they're good tips. I agree. Um, I'm a big fan of lists and even just the notes in my phone. I have, that's my son. How cute is he? Um, <laughs> I've got a list of the tasks that I want to do each day and then I have like my bigger life goals and my values down the bottom because I'm a value junkie and um I do set small measurable achievable realistic goals because otherwise I get defeated um and I try to do the hardest things first in the day because that's when I've got all my energy and I've just had caffeine and I know myself and by the end of the day I'm spent I'm you know I'm done <laughs> so I try and get all the things I need to the hardest things first um, and if there's something I really need to do that isn't work related, I actually try and do it before I go to work because some days at work, you just know that you're not going to have a break. Um, and so that might mean getting up a bit earlier. Um, yeah, just having some realistic insight into the things you actually have to get done, the things that can wait and then having, um, that ability to go, okay, I'm going to leave this and deal with this on this other day and then let it go. Don't let it sort of burden you. So it's like parking a problem. Um, yeah. And then also like dual tasking. I know that, you know, we shouldn't multitask and all that jazz, but as a doctor, you totally have to multitask. And so for example, if you have to go to a meeting, you can probably be doing work at the meeting, unless you're running the meeting, like you could take some paperwork or whatever. If you're um, driving you can listen to lectures if you um, are I don't know oh, I'm just trying to think like just be creative when you see all your list of jobs have them all written down so you know so because if it's written down in a list you have control over it and you can you've got the opportunity to actually get through them all because the last thing you want is to just wing it and not have achieved everything you needed to do over day so at least if it's written down you can then pace yourself um, and you can work out when you can do things in pockets of time that are sort of like um, hidden time that you can win. So things like meetings and driving and things like that. So just getting creative and every day, have your rituals and routines 
put in place for your self-care that can be quite efficient. So my morning ritual is like 10 minutes. I wake up, have coffee, I do my affirmations mantra, I do a bit of journaling, three things I'm grateful for, five big goals, do a bit of stretching. And that's all done really quickly. And I've really had a big bang of self-care done. Um, and then if you've got your rituals and routines, but your lifestyle changes, maybe you get posted to a different location, you got to do a different shift or whatever, just try and be flexible and adaptive because the nature of being a doctive doctor is that you often have to be flexible and adaptive. So being sort of having your rituals and structures, but kind of being um, flexible about it at the same time in order to get all the things you need to do done, even when your um, roles and expectations and pressures are changing. I'd, I'd like to say that if, if you could see my desk, you'd all go, oh, my God, we don't ever want to be like her because <laughs> I have a desk that's covered with piles of paper and one year it featured in the end of year pediatric quiz of whose de desk is this. And what was really embarrassing was that people guessed correctly, um, but there were some noble sort of runner, runners up to my desk. I think one of the things about kind of acceptance is also knowing that for all of us there is far too much to do and we're not going to get it all done and so one of the things I find really important is to be able to say to myself you know what are the things that are really going to matter um, as, as the others have been saying but also to tell other people to actually say look I'm really sorry I'm probably not going to be able to get that done in the time frame that you want um, and, and to be really clear with myself about what, what's going to matter most. So actually at the end of the day, because I'm a team leader, if there's someone in my team who needs my time, who pops into the office, that is going to out-trump most other things apart from making sure that patient safety is, is okay. Um, and so I think some of it also depends on what personal tolerance you've got for chaos around you. Mine's is reasonably high, um, but a lot of my colleagues, it's a lot lower. They would never share a room with me. Um, so it is trying to sort out what, what can you live with and actually which things do you end up needing to escalate to the system you work in to say, I would love to do this, but I can't because the hours I have are not sufficient to be able to do this. I acknowledge that that's much, much harder to do when you're a trainee because you're sitting there having run reports and if the registrar before you um, stayed till nine o'clock every night finishing all the letters and chasing up all the lab reports, then it's really hard to be the person who comes along and says, I'm really sorry, I've got kids to pick up from crash at five o'clock, I can't stay, I can't do that. Um, so I, I don't have any honest answers about, about how we manage it, and apart from it being um, something that needs to keep being signaled to other people. It's nice to hear I'm not alone <laughs> in the chaos. <laughs> I think, can I just uh, say, I, I think one of the things that came out of what Louise just said is, is knowing yourself. So she's got great insight into, into um, you know, how she works and how she operates and she's accepted that and and you know one of the things that worked for me was figuring out what kind of person you know may improve my um time management was figuring out what kind of person i am so one of the things i did that came out of a meeting with a sleep psychologist was figuring out what parts of the day i worked better and was more productive and you know being okay with it for me i'm actually a bit of a night owl and, and an afternoon person so i'm not leaping out of bed like Susanna and 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 doing those affirmations bring in the morning because I'm not I'm not really that person. So I do my some of my self-care and things like that in the evening. Also, when I'm going to be doing some of my study and time, I figured out with my for me what works for my body um, in terms of focusing my time management and my um, my study time, for example. Um, so I think that's an important thing as well, knowing what works for you as you personally, because what works for your colleague who's really successful and has done great, passed their exams and all that, isn't necessarily going to be the best thing for you. And accepting that. It's a really good reminder. Thanks, Glenn. And I think there's been some further questions come through the chat, which um, I'd love to find. Um, 
Oh, so Prue's asked, um, so often the personalities of doctors mean that others can see the signs of burnout before the individual. Helping someone utilise the wellbeing strategy she's spoken about today can be difficult. Do you have any suggestions around this? Look, that's tough. I think what you're saying is if you notice someone might be burnt out, how do you help them? I think that's what that person's asking. At the end of the day, people have to help themselves. Um, and it can be unhelpful if you approach someone in that state and go, I'm worried about you. It can actually make them feel really vulnerable and uncomfortable. <laughs> so it's pretty tricky. Um, I think you've got to take each situation individually and just see if you're the appropriate person to make that move. And if you've got a relationship where you think it's going to be received well, then totally get in there. I mean, it can save a life if you check in with someone and say, are you okay? You know, um, but if you're not that person, then you probably want to be, you know, thinking about who's the right person to do it. I think I, when I find someone who I is worried, if I notice someone I'm worried about, I will probably share some of the stories I've been through so they feel safe around me and um, feel that I will understand what they're going through. And so by having some vulnerability about myself, I'm sort of making it even um, so that they can feel vulnerable around me too. Because um, at the end of the day, you know, I'm not particularly different from any other person. And so I just being able to connect and, and, and offering, hey, look, I found this hard for me. Like, I wonder if you relate to that. Are you okay? It makes it a lot more safe. Um, Dr. Webster mentioned um, self-care as, as an opportunity to role model. And I really do believe that by looking after yourself and practicing all of these things and role modeling it, people do notice and you're basically part of culture change. So if you can walk into what you see as that broken system and be your authentic self and go, oh, I'm sorry, that's too much work for me today. That's going to have to wait till tomorrow. I'm sorry, I actually need my lunch break and I'm going to take my lunch outside. Then people notice and just by you role modeling it and you doing it, you're part of doing it differently. This, there is, because the thing, thing is that um, people do notice and if, if they can see someone doing it, then they realize how it's done and then they have more opportunity to do it for themselves. So I think that's another thing is that if you have, if when you become more senior or even if you've just got a colleague you're worried about, um, just, you don't even have to lecture them. You just show them, just be around them and show them how you care for yourself and sort of gently nudge them like a dolphin in the right direction. And when it comes to this broken system, everyone talks about, unfortunately, there is no one person in power. There's no one system that's broken to be fixed. It's like a whole bunch of everything that's like burnt out. So where do you begin? And I really think that the solution lies in each and every one of us and our actions and what we bring to the mix. And if we all bring something healthy and sustainable and loving and nurturing and compassionate, then it will just come together as a whole and a collective. So yeah, that's tough. <laughs> But this is also a place where you can, and I totally agree with those comments, where you can actually um, be a bit of an advocate for change in the system through your actions. So one of the things that we had tried to normalise in our department is professional supervision and seeking out regular check-ins as a prevention technique rather than necessarily once you've burned out. And by kind of normalising that everybody, you know, is encouraged to go, um, then actually um, sometimes people who they can do that without fear of kind of signaling something about how they're feeling because sometimes that's private to them and they might not want to share that but they can go and if you you know I try and say to people well I'm I, I go regularly for my check-in and people know that then they might feel comfortable to do that too. I'd, I'd just like to put a really big plug for um, supportive supervision. I, I think it's um, it's something that I was really surprised when I'd finished my paediatric training and then went into psychiatry training. I sort of thought, gosh, this is really weird. I'm, I'm having supervision. Um, and I, I now can't imagine practicing without having um, supervision. I've had both individual supervision, but I've also belonged to 
a group of colleagues who have group supervision. It's a closed group, so we choose who comes into it. And I guess if you're going to have group supervision, you've got to trust people that they can um, be respectful and good listeners, and you've got to have a good supervisor. Um, and and I think that also models or, or it gets us to practice being able to talk to colleagues because uh, one of you was, I can't remember who, was talking about how, how hard it is for us to be able to go to a colleague and say, look, I've got this case and I haven't a clue what I'm doing with it or I can't figure out why this isn't um, why this isn't working. And, and one, of the, one of the most valuable things is to be able to talk to our colleagues and run stuff past them to be able to reveal um, our, our sort of sense of, I don't know what to do here, or I've tried everything I know and none of it's worked, or um, do you have any helpful things, even things like, you know, running emails before you send them past trusted colleagues so that they can go, don't send that, that email, Louise, you know. <laughs> Let's just, you know, take all the capital letters out, please. Um, <laughs> things like that, that you, that you have to sort of just um, censor it. So, so being able to use our colleagues and our relationships with each other as a really big resource. And I think the more we do that, um, then the more open we are to being able to express concern about each other or to be able to say, actually, I'm having a horrible week. Um, and it may have nothing to do with work, it might be something at, at home, um, or it might be that we've just had one of those weeks where we feel like we get out of the wrong side of the bed every morning and it's, it's not a good week. But, but the more that we encourage those sorts of collegial relationships with our, with our teams, with our colleagues, with, with everyone that we, we were, that the easier it will be to be able to raise concerns or express um, distress. Thank you for that. Um, I know we've got one more question and I wonder if, if everyone's okay in the interest of time if we do find that out. It's a really good one, I think. Um, Alexandra's just asking, um, I, wanted, uh, I want to know what structure you've found useful in supervision sessions. I've started with a psychologist, but it feels like a meandering conversation and I don't know how to do this with more purpose and structure. Can I just say, it's a bit like finding a GP. You've got to find one who's a good fit for you. And so I would always encourage people if they're finding a supervisor to try them out. And, and often experienced supervisors will say, look, let's, let's meet for three sessions and see how it goes. Um, and to be able to be a little bit ruthless if at the end of three sessions, you just sort of feel like this is not working for me to, to try someone else, to, to ask others around. Um, I suppose I hear from colleagues a variety of things. Sometimes I've heard people say that it's incredibly useful to have someone outside of the system, but I think it's really important that they have enough understanding of the work that we do that they don't spend the entire session being kind of horrified by, <laughs> by what our daily work is um, and traumatised by it. So, so there are some telling things in that in itself, but. But I, I would just encourage people to, um, to shop around and find someone who's a good fit. The other thing I'd say is that um, some supervisors have a really open-ended sort of psychotherapeutic, lots of big silences, and, and some will, will be more comfortable with a more structured thing to even be able to negotiate how you'd like the, the um, supervision session to be. And and what sort of options they can offer and what you feel most comfortable with and not comfortable with. So I think there should be some negotiating about that as well. Prithi, you'd probably um, give your staff advice about that as well. Yeah, I think that's really good advice that you've just given. And um, I guess the other things too are also um, maybe to do a little bit of preparation for your session. So to check in with yourself beforehand and go, okay, what are the thorny beasts that are currently keeping me up at night and just list them down and see you know because those might be the things where you're a bit stuck and you want to to get through those and so then you've got a list of things that you want to talk about um 
Yeah, I think those are the main things. And um, the other thing is just, I think there was a question around how would you access it? And I know um, there was the, um, we had the video in the break that hopefully people watched about um, EAP and the college and what support can be given there. But also MPS have a number of um, uh, free sessions. Um, the hospital will also have EAP. And so there are some free sessions that you can get. But in actual fact, um, and I know this is different for trainees where there's not a lot of CME dollars, but you know, you, you know, people have used that because it's a it's a valid use of our CME. Mm. So there's lots of different ways to access it. Great, thank you. That's fabulous. And I can personally um uh, attest to the usefulness of supervision. Um, I'm very lucky to work at Starship with Louise and she's offering group supervision to the paediatric registrars there. Um, and I do, um, even when I don't have at CME to access, I've found it uh, worthwhile to, to shell out my own money for psychologist support. So, yeah. I mean, sorry, we have one last question, which I think people will really um, want to hear about. Um, one of our um, registrants has asked for some top tips for managing anxiety and the wait to sit exams. I'll give a couple for me, since I'm currently sitting exams and I just failed oh, a bunch. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think, you know, we know all of the usual exam prep tropes, so we probably don't need to go through all of those. And that's having all your resources and, and you know, utilizing knowledge from people going through. But the first thing to accept is acknowledge that it's okay to feel anxious about the exam. It's totally fine. Um, it's a very natural human emotion. It's a big life event. It's stressful. Um, yes, it's something that you need to pass, but it also doesn't define you. And whether it takes you one go, two goes, three goes, whatever the maximum amount is, as long as you get through that, it's a key thing. So allow yourself to be okay with the fact that you're vulnerable about the exam to start with. And once you've kind of shelved that in your mind a little bit, then you can prepare more, a little bit more on, you know, those things that would help with written exams, formalized study plans, groups, utilizing your colleagues. And then for clinicals, I guess one thing I would say that I learned from the military was battle breathing, um, which I find quite useful in Viva type techniques. Um, and it's, I think a variant of what Susanna was doing earlier, but again, focusing on your own breath, a four second inspiration, a four second hold period, a four second exhale. It's something that we teach um, soldiers in combat um, to control and you know and um, bring down their SNS tone, um, and it can work really well um, for anxiety pre-exam. So that's one little tip, or two little tips I would give personally. I would say, um, well, the first thing is don't make things worse. So sometimes when we're anxious, we want to avoid our anxiety or escape it or numb out to it, and we can go and do a whole bunch of things that just make our lives worse. So you know, when I was a trainee for exams, you know, we get ex anxious and go to the pub or something and you wouldn't sleep as well and blah 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 so get rid of that stuff as best you can and then yeah working on your relationship with fear um what dr williams said about uh, a certain amount of anxiety is actually inevitable and, and natural and you know uh, drives performance so check in with your relationship with that experience of anxiety there's a really good book that i love by dr Russ Harris called the fear trap and that's very helpful and then know yourself which we've all been talking about understanding yourself and your needs and just prioritizing that stuff in the lead up to the exams preparing early on I am an anxious person and the way I got through my exams was I started studying way in advance so I was like well over it and I um, was really prepared and organized and got through what I felt I needed to do to feel in control of the data which was a delusional sense of control but it just helped me manage my anxiety and get through so you got to work out how you study best and then try and design a life that will facilitate that um, and yeah, whatever self-care means to you. So it might mean prioritizing more time in the garden or, um, you know, getting a swim in at the local pool twice a week or whatever it is that you need. Um, and sleep is a huge one. So, which can be tricky when you're stressed out of your brain. So um, yeah, I could talk for ages about anxiety management. <laughs> I, I would, I think they're great, great tips. I would also say that, you know, college exams are ones that we know there's a certain failure rate. And, and we just have to also say that every year there are some people who don't pass where everyone's going, 
how come they didn't pass? So, um, you know, for all of us coming to this level, we're usually people who've passed everything at school, we've passed everything at university, kind of, and then suddenly we come to exams where parts of it can have a pass rate of 60%, and you're going, well, one of the things I think to say is it doesn't mean, as, as Glenn was saying, doesn't mean that I'm a terrible person or I'm a useless trainee if I don't pass this time. You know, the statistics are that eventually uh, we do pass. So I think being able to almost forgive ourselves in advance and go, yep, it's not what I want, but it's not the end of the world if I don't pass this time around. And then I, I suppose one of the things I found really helpful in the two systems of exams that I did, and I had to do serious negotiating with my husband once I went to psychiatry and sort of say, my sorry, sorry darling, I'm going to have to put you through a second set of specialist exams. Will you, you know, will you, will you still love me if I if I fail them? <laughs> sort of stuff like that. Um, but but I had to keep saying to myself, this is about a clinical process and when I was sitting there feeling brain dead in the middle of, of clinical exams to go, if I was on call and I saw this patient, what would I do? Because usually when people are sitting exams, we've got oodles, all those nights on call, or oodles and oodles of um, clinical experience. And our safest thing is to go, don't think about what I think the examiner might want. Um, think about what common sense thing would I be doing if I saw this patient in a clinic or in the middle of the night, or when I was on call, um, and stick with that. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That's all really excellent tips. And I wish we could go on for longer, but um, we are really um, I'm quite overdoing it. Um, this is the nature of the panel. It's been fantastic. We won't have to wrap up now. Um, there are a few quick um, PSAs um, that we'd like to do just before closing the session. So um, I'd just like, like to quickly um, just remind all trainees um, that Aotearoa New Zealand um, Trainee Committee does hold a trainees day um, on an annual basis and next year it's going to be on the 2nd of April um, in Rotorua. Um, early bird registrations are now open and I believe we have a short video um, to familiarise ourselves with Rotorua. And In a place where history and tradition are treasured and passed down. Follow in the footsteps of voyagers, those that first walked this heated earth, and seek out your horizons. Where the natural environment beckons from your very doorstep, Open your eyes and let in that first light of day where the surrounding world embraces you and heightens your senses. Let it take your breath away. Connect to the elements here like nowhere else on Earth. yourself in healing waters that have soothed voyages for centuries and continue to shape the lives of those who call this place home. Come together and with a spark, let your senses come alive. Find your element in Rotorua. 
gorgeous. So as you can see, Rotorua is a beautiful place and um, our trainees day next year is an, a good excuse to um, connect and reflect uh, with your fellow trainees from around the motu. Um, we welcome Australian trainees as well, even though this is an Aotearoa New Zealand setting. Um, of course, COVID levels and border restrictions allowing, um, we can be optimistic. <laughs> and so I'd like to hand over to Tom for a quick message. Thanks, Amelia. And just as another reminder about that trainees day, that it is recognised as a um, as a reimbursable expense by most of the um, by the both of the RMO unions. So you should be able to attend, funded by your DHB, including travel costs. So if you want an excuse to get away to Rotorua, um, get on it. And it's on a Saturday; should be easy enough to get leave for most people. It's just a Saturday, and it's, it's reimbursable all costs. Um, next announcement we want to talk about is the um, is the Aotearoa New Zealand um, trainees network. So just a bit of background. So we, um, Amelia and I co-chair the um, Aotearoa New Zealand Trainees Committee, uh, which was established to represent and advocate for trainees across the country. Um, but we're just one committee and we do believe that better connections with trainees will facilitate better representation and advocacy. So to achieve this, we're forming what we call the Trainees Network, which basically what we're aiming to do is get an adult and paediatric trainee representative in each training hospital in the country. Um, and, and, and in turn, those representatives provide a direct contact between trainees across the country and the, um, the Aotearoa New Zealand Trainees Committee and more broadly with the, the college as a whole. Um, so we're looking to set this up and we're very keen to find people who will be interested to be a part of us. Um, so we believe that the Trainees Network will allow um, all trainees to feel more connected to each other and to the college and will allow us as a Trainees Committee to better understand what's going on and better advocate for training issues and assist trainees in accessing help um, where issues um, arise. Um, we know that navigating training schemes and, and the college can sometimes be overwhelming and confusing and we're hoping that this network will be part of a trainee centred solution um, and also co to coordinate the valuable experiences of our trainees to develop innovative improvements that can help all trainees. So um, yeah, we're trying to get um, a representative and for adults and peds from each hospital in the country. Um, so if you'd like to be a representative at, at your hospital, just get in touch. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Uh, back to Amelia. So just to quickly wrap up the session, I'd like to um, start with a huge thank you to our speakers and panellists. So that's Dr. Susanna, Louise, um, Michelle and Glenn, um, as well as Fritha. We've just, yeah, a wealth of so many pills today that I'll be taking away. Um, really appreciate your time because I know you're all busy and um, sort of got, making time for trainees is very, very much appreciated. And I want to reflect that you guys are part of trying to change that culture that we're all railing against. Um, I'd also like to um, say a huge thank you to the RACP staff who have been um, behind the scenes working really hard to put this together for us. Um, kind of the training committee kind of comes up with really ideas people but actually the practicalities of putting this all together are something that Tom and I didn't have much of a hand in um, but it's all magically come together thanks to um, Keely, uh, Paula, uh, Kit and I think Ethan's in the background there as well so thank you so much. Um, just a reminder to use the QR code which will be available at the end of this event to complete the two-minute survey. Um, your feedback um, has helped form um, this year's session and we hope um, to hold this again next year so there'll be really valuable information. I'll hand over to Tom now for our um, karakia to close the session. Thanks, Amelia. So just our closing karakia. Um, so, unu here, unu here, unu here, ki te uru tapu nui, ki a wātea, ki a māma, te a ngāko, te tīnana, te wairua, i te ala tākata, koia rā i rongo, whakaere a ake, ki runga, ki a tīna, tīna, huia, taikia. Thanks everyone for attending.